Hello and welcome to this episode of Digital Mental Health Musings. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Tanya McMahon, coming to you from Turrbal and Yagara country. Now, today's chat is with a really key digital mental health service. And I say key because it falls into a really important category when it comes to digital mental health, and that's treatment services. Now, you might think, well, isn't all digital mental health treatment of some kind? Well, yes and no. With so many options out there, we find it really helpful to separate out tools such as websites and apps, which really support and complement mental health and well-being with information, tips, strategies, social connections, stuff like that. Uh, separate that out from treatments, which are full standalone interventions, which are there to, to treat specific disorders like depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, and so on. Now, digital mental health treatments more or less mimic what you might receive if seeing a therapist face-to-face, -face, a full course of treatment, which is usually somewhere between four and 12 sessions or lesson, lessons or modules of cognitive behavior therapy. And obviously there are other evidence-based therapeutic approaches out there, but cognitive behavior therapy or CBT uh, lends itself really well to being translated online and has a very strong and broad evidence base. So that's why um, the majority of these programs are based on it. So there are just a few key players out there in the digital mental health treatment space. And our guests today are firmly in that space. They are from Mental Health Online, an initiative of Swinburne University's National E-Therapy Center. And Mental Health Online provides online information, assessment, self-guided and therapist assisted programs for a variety of mental health issues. And today our guests are Associate Professor Neil Thomas and Dr. Haley Tremaine. Neil is the director of the National E-Therapy Centre and deputy director of the Centre for Mental Health at Swinburne University of Technology. He's the head of Mental Health Online. And alongside this, he leads a research program on developing therapeutic approaches to help people living with mental health problems uh, with a particular focus on the use of digital technologies. Welcome, Neil. Thanks for joining us. Hi, great to, great to be here, Tanya. And Haley is a clinical psychologist whose role with Mental Health Online mainly focuses on supporting uh, the mental health online therapists to build positive and effective therapeutic relationships with clients, utilizing video, telephone, email, and live chat modalities. She completed her PhD and postdoc fellowship in digital mental health and also works as a senior lecturer in clinical psychology and in a telehealth-based private practice. So welcome, Haley. Thank you, Tanya. Good to be here. So to start us off, can you both tell us just briefly about what you guys do at Swinburne what, and what your roles are with, with Mental Health Online? So, so yeah, I mean, my, my, my main role is I'm an academic with the, with the university. So I'm in the School of Health Sciences, but I've got a particular focus on research. And um, within that, my particular interests are around therapies, particularly psychological therapies, and within that, particularly digital therapies for mental health problems. And so, so part of what I do is conducting research into like how can we develop new treatments and innovate in that area. But also as part of that, I uh, oversee Mental Health Online uh, as, a, as a service which is actually funded by the Australian government in order to be providing these services to the public. So, so Mental Health Online actually functions really well within within the university as, as a bridge between the research activities we do, also the, the training that we do of postgraduate clinical psychology students and so on um, with service provision. So, so the public can benefit from the, from the work that we're doing at Swinburne. So I'm mainly working within, you know, with Swinburne within Mental Health Online. So most of my work is within Mental Health Online and most of my Mental Health Online work is within the therapist assisted provision, so what we think of as our um, the Mental Health Online Clinic. So as you said, Tanya, um, most of what I do is supporting our therapists. Um, so I'm at the coalface in terms of, you know, the client work and supporting our therapists with the work that they do, um, they do there. And as Neil mentioned, um, we do, because we're sort of embedded in the university context, we can leverage um, the fact that we have uh, training clinical psychologists, so those are the people that mostly fill the role of therapists at Mental Health Online. So a lot of my work is in the in the training and mentoring and sort of supporting the therapists to do the work that they do for us. 
Fantastic. And that's wonderful that you, you know, these, um, you know, young budding professionals are actually, you know, getting this, this fantastic training in a really innovative cutting edge space um, as part of their training. Um, that's great that you, you guys can do that. And so tell me the story of mental health online for, you know, maybe some of our listeners who aren't, um, aren't familiar mm-hmm. with it. How, what is it and how did it come about? Yeah. Uh- I, mean, I guess it started probably probably about 15 years or so ago. Um, so that was a time where at Swinburne we had a particular interest in cognitive behaviour therapy treatments for ang- a range of mental health problems, but especially anxiety type problems. So by that, thinking about disorders like like generalised anxiety disorder, where people are troubled by persisting worry, panic disorder, where people may have frequent panic attacks, maybe. Uh, have difficulties leaving the house, social anxiety, as well as related problems like obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD. And so as well as there being an interest in sort of traditional in-person psychological therapies, there was a growing interest at that time in digital treatments. So um, this is before my time, so, so Rick Klein, Mark Kyrgios, David Austin and others at that time were really um some of the first generation of trialing digital self-guided cbt courses whereby people can gain access to uh, you know effective evidence-based therapy material in a different modality from going and, and seeing a seeing a therapist in person so there were a number of programs developed for different d- different um, disorders, you know, syndromes, different presentations within that, that were trialed and, and tested out to ensure that they're effective. And then that, that paved the way for the opportunity to get funding from the government to actually make those more widely available. So originally Mental Health Online was Anxiety Online with a particular focus on these anxiety-related problems. But mm. as time's gone on, we've had broader interests. So in, in mood disorders as well. And, uh, you know, I've got, I've got particular interests also in severe mental health problems. So, so it's growing around that those, those long-standing anxiety-related um, programs into incorporating further programs for a range of other presentations. And so, so it's now been running for a long time, of course. Mm. So we've seen o- over 100,000 people who've been able to use mental health. Wow. Management. Those are big numbers. Yeah, yeah. Mm. What I love um, in particular about Mental Health Online is that it, it really seems to have helped pave the pathway towards blended care, which we're starting to hear a lot about where we have treatment delivered with this kind of mixture of online and offline components uh, kind of a combination of the two and it seems it's done that in a couple of ways um, which I'd really love to um, explore in more detail so firstly it's got the therapist assist program where people can get free assistance from a mental health online therapist as they go through the program Um, And then also the health practitioner access to the program for clinicians who want to be able to integrate it into their face-to-face treatment. So starting with the Therapist Assist program, can you tell us a bit about it, what it involves? Yeah, I can can absolutely do that. Um, So the Therapist Assisted program provides 12 weeks of support um, for clients via various modalities. So we use email, we use video, we use live chat, and we can use um, what's akin to a phone call, but it's an audio only sort of modality. So clients can, you know, we we really sort of focus on choice and autonomy. So clients can, you know, they they choose whether and when to engage in therapist assist. So they can, you know, the the programs can be self-guided. Um, but if they choose therapist assist, when they do that is totally up to them. It doesn't have to be at the beginning of their um, time with us. They could come in at any point um, and then they can choose which modalities they prefer as well. So we have a default of email. The, the majority of contact is email contact, but we also offer those different you know, additional types of support and encourage clients to, to take up those types of support as well. So they'll work with their therapist for, as I said, a, a period of 12 weeks. Um, and the, the work with that therapist is usually focused on 
uh, you know, we've got that program, obviously, that's the core of the work they're doing together, but it'll be sort of tailoring, it'll be understanding how the program does or, or perhaps doesn't fit in with what the, the client is looking um, looking for. It'll be, you know, helping with engagement, which, as we know, is, is one of the, the big, you know, um, the big issues we tackle in digital mental health. It might be sort of navigation, those sorts of things as well. Um, so it could be any number of things um, that the, the therapist is helping them with. And I think, you know, just in terms of the trajectory, clients will, will let us know that they're interested in therapist assist. Mm -hmm. And we, um, we're we really about removing barriers. So we'll really quickly get back to them and arrange an intake call where we get to know them. And then we'll really quickly after the intake calls, we usually do this in a period about a, of about a week, introduce them to their therapist and then they yep. get started from there. Mm -hmm. So their therapist is different to the person conducting the intake call. Or does, is it sometimes the same? It's sometimes the same, but not by design. Yes, it's, um, by design. you know, all of our therapists, you know, are involved in, in conducting these intake calls. So it, mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, the intake call will usually be one clinician, and the the um, therapist allocated will usually be someone else. Yeah, and um, you said that the the therapists are um, um, a lot of them are the the ones coming through their training at Swinburne. Is that the the majority of the therapists, or do you have um, other other people fulfilling those roles? Yeah, and that's a really good point. But we do, you know, that's our one of the the main functions is, of course, providing you know treatment to clients. But we have a really important secondary function, which is that we're actually we operate as a training clinic for um, for therapists. So most of our therapists are provisional psychologists completing postgraduate training in clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. um, but we have had um, therapists come through from different backgrounds, for example, in, in counselling programs or, or it, with the forensic specialisation or um, mm -hmm. people of different backgrounds as well. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them are uh, Swinburne students. It just so happens that they're enrolled in, in um, so, you know, we have that relationship there, but we welcome students from, from other institutions and universities as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just depends on interest and um, availability and all that sort of thing. Mm. So the therapists are from uh, one place or another coming through some kind of clinical training. Um, so they're getting that really good supervision. They're getting, you know, lots of follow up and check in um, um, with the process. That's right. It's almost always a student placement. It's not always. We have, um, you know, at various times had, um, you know, people that are, are employed and offering therapy, particularly when we had a very large increased demand, you know, during the the, um, the worst of the COVID nineteen pandemic. Mm -hmm. But um, by and large, most of our work is most of our clinical work is done by people who are on a, a formal sort of student placement, and they receive, you know, as part of their role. Therefore, they receive a lot of training and guidance in the kind of work you know that we do here. Fantastic. Yeah, and I've, I've, you know, people have asked before about, you know, with, with um, interacting with student therapists, because a lot of people don't necessarily, you know, they hear the word student, they don't necessarily understand the level of, of supervision and guidance people get. And I go, you're actually sometimes better off <laughs> with a student therapist because, because they, they, they want to do really well. They're trying, they're, they're in the thick of it. They're learning this stuff, you know, it, they're swimming in it and they're getting great supervision and, and that guidance for anything that they're not sure of. So, you know, um, that, that, you know, people can really, really trust in the, the quality of, of care they're getting in that, in that kind of um, setting. Yeah, I mean, there's and there's absolutely a lot. There's there's so much thought that's, mm. that the the therapists are putting into yeah. um, email communications and setting up for the interactions. So so there's a great opportunity. But yeah, yeah, we we have regular with various types of supervision, like the one to one supervisor. We have regular weekly group format supervision, and they've got day daily kind of access to support from uh, from Haley and others. So yeah, um, so there's 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 very clear support for them yeah. in the service. Yeah. And in terms of, I, I don't know if you've got any stats off the top of your head, but I'm really interested to know, like when you said that uh, the therapist assist program is, you know, it's really up to people. Do you know off the top of your head, how many people coming into the program choose the therapist assist? Yeah. I mean, the majority, the majority actually prefer to do programs on their on their own um so it is a minority that are doing therapist assist which is which is interesting because i mean if we if we look at the if we look at the literature there's certainly a lot of arguments for therapist assisted um online cbt mm. being being the preferred model which I, I guess is on the basis of it being um 
people's engagement in the programs and therefore outcomes can be better. Although interestingly, there was a, a recent um, meta-analysis looking at anxiety, which which was I think it was more questionable whether that that's the case in anxiety, maybe mm. more so in depression. But uh, but certainly, what we see as a service is that many people actually have a distinct preference for having the autonomy um, of doing something self-guided and. So one of the common bits of feedback we get from the group that, that choose not to have therapist assist is that um, they, they, you know, one of their reasons for coming was because they would never, it would just would have been too much of a barrier to actually see somebody to it's talk about it. And feel, yeah, feel sort of, I guess, feel under the spotlight um, uh, talking about one's problems. And so, so it, it, it's interesting in, in, in for some people, this can be, you know, effective course of treatment and then people do well with it. For some people, it's also maybe testing the waters mm. with getting an initial form of help, which could be doing it on their own. It could be trying sort of email based communication, which might be a little less confronting than go, go, or doing video or, or going to a going to a practice and seeing someone in person. So it may help people with a help seeking journey as well. Yeah. So, it's playing that role. And that, yeah, isn't that interesting that the medium um, here, you know, is potentially drawing in people who picked it for that reason that they, you know, yeah. they like the anonymity, they like the autonomy, they don't really want, they don't feel like talking to someone is is what they need at that, at that point in time. Yeah. So, so the key thing with this is about choice. Really. choice. So we know that the people will People will have different preferences in, in terms of the type of service which they will have. We don't want to be putting up barriers to that. So we certainly encourage and welcome people having the therapist assist option. And we'd see that sort of on average, you know, the best the, the best possible potential benefits from the program is going to be with that option. But um, people can people can make those decisions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think this is the the um, you know big theme um, uh, that we see across. The digital mental health landscape is choice is that none of these things are intended or, or promoted to be a, a fix all or fix everyone or you know if this doesn't work for you well then that, that's pretty much all there is you know it should work um no this is really about offering people lots of choices lots of formats so that people can actually find the the format um the the medium you know that suits them uh so that that sounds exactly like like how this works and uh, uh, the other question I had uh, out of curiosity, do you happen to know how many people prefer when it comes to the people who do pick therapist assist, how many people prefer email versus over the phone versus chat? Is there any, is there any pattern or is, is it really varied? It was, you know, just going back to the, the journey of mental health online, we, um, it must have been six years ago, five or six years ago, Neil, that we started offering mm. other ways of contacting um, clients mm. other than email. Mm. And um, we, we trialled it initially and, and we, you know, clients were just very positive in their, in their feedback. So we decided to keep it. And almost all of those um, clients that we, that we see through to the end of their therapist assist will have had some form of live communication with our therapists. Um, well, all of them will have had a, an intake call, which is always live, but all, some form of synchronous communication. But I will put a little asterisk on that to say our therapists encourage synchronous communication as well. So I'm, it, that mm-hmm. that doesn't necessarily wholly reflect the client's choice. They're not forced to, of course. They can mm-hmm. absolutely stick with email if they prefer. Um, but we do um, tend to want to get to know clients in a synchronous format as well if we can. Yeah. But almost all that make it all the way through. And, and so there is a... a, a association between engagement and, and using those other um you know th- those other media but the association could be that they're somewhat quite engaged so they also want to try those other types of um you know this this sort of um synchronous types of contact as well yeah yeah and- I, th- I think the video is more popular than the text chat isn't it mm. so but but there is still that and, and again again there's there's often reasons for people's preferences potentially for the text chat as well so mm. yeah but and then I guess videos, of course, become a lot more commonplace for us all in the past couple of years. Yeah, it has. And the other thing about the the offering a choice of modality is that we get to use that as part of the treatment. 
So if we had somebody that was a little bit, um, you know, sort of unsure about using a video modality, we can set that out and we can, the therapist can use that as part of their, for example, um, anxiety program is to, yes. why don't we try, you know, moving towards a video session at the end of our time together as well. So it, it can really be, you know, it, it doesn't have to be separate from, you know, the modality isn't different to the treatment, the modality can be part of what's mm. helpful, you know, sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess when we've had feedback from people um, as well about the different modalities, it, it, it's like there's there's the pros and cons of both. So so the 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 video is obviously good for doing things like, you know, sort of problem solving, doing the individual tailoring, sort of like like actually thinking about, okay, how do I take this material and uh and and actually apply it in the best possible way because that there's often a need for sort of thinking about that in real time and exchange backwards and forwards. With the with the email, people people appreciate the opportunity to have a more reflective space, so so that they can like you know sort of look look at some material, spend some time thinking and writing. And so there's there's maybe a different mode. It's like the, the slow mode versus versus the quick mode yeah. of, of doing that, as well as it also being that ongoing record that people can can use and reflect on in the future of course, as well. Of course, go back over it. Yeah, so it provide it's nice having that combination, which is what we what we do. So mm. so that people can you know get get the best of both worlds, I guess. Yeah, and how do the therapists keep within the the bounds of you know the the nature of that therapeutic relationship I imagine it as you know the the weeks go on and that the the alliance the therapeutic alliance strengthens that that there'd probably be a lot of people wanting to talk about other things you know how, how is it kept on task it's a good it's a good question and I think that the the short answer is through you know training and, and consultation and supervision and the long answer is that um, in practice, it may be that for three weeks they don't talk about the program with their with their client. They talk about something that's going on in their life alongside the program. So we're, we're not particularly, even though we do have that focus and it's very explicit, we're not prescriptive in that way either. If, if it's, mm. um, you know, and for some, for some of our clients, the, you know, the greatest benefit they can get from working with us is actually a positive experience of help seeking Mm. entirely separate to their evidence-based CBT program that's that's sitting next to the you know what I mean so it's really quite tailored and our therapists do tend to start with us with this idea that we can we, we must talk program and that's what we have to do and once the relationships develop they do have to they test that a little bit they stretch that a little bit and um you know by and large they're they're pretty used to coming in and asking if something sort of I'm not sure is this mm. you know is this us or is this something we will refer out for yeah. um they'll you know we'll, we'll have a conversation about that in group supervision usually and, and discuss the pros and cons of of both yeah so it sounds like you, either way there's there's a uh, the real good guardrails in place for you know it's not really it's not overly rigid in in terms of that you know you're just going to get well let's bring it back to the program all the time. There's, there's some flexibility there, but there's also these guardrails to, you know, help with those, those trickier situations where it might start to feel more than just about the program and helping people through it. And, and of course, a lot of it is just about matching people with the, the, the type of help that they need. So, mm. so you know, people who come through to us and it's like, well, actually they, they more want counselling. They want to talk, mm. talk and express themselves, talk about problems mm. rather than work through a, a, a program that's more, sort of skills based um so so in those cases where you know we try and link people up with the most appropriate mm-hmm. um services for their needs mm-hmm. and what a wonderful thing what a you know wonderful problem to occur is oh i realized i actually prefer this kind of modality i've actually learned something about myself you know i've actually learned something about what i need um i think that's a, a you know a wonderful wonderful problem to have because i think a lot of people don't even know where to start um sometimes when it comes to getting getting help the other feature I really wanted to explore was um, health practitioner access because that's that too is quite a unique feature, not something that all programs offer. Um, can you tell us about that? You know, what what is it that health practitioners can access? Sure. Will I go ahead, Neil? Yeah, yeah. Uh, health, in short, health practitioners can access um, the say everything that our clients can access in terms of our programs. So the full programs and all of the resources. 
are made available for free. Just the portal's different. Rather than going through a client portal, they go through a health prof professional portal. Mm -hmm. um, and that, those are, when we say health practitioners, it's not you know, necessarily people with a mental health background. You know, it could be. It can be other allied health backgrounds. Anyone in any, um, you know, helping adjacent profession really is, is welcome to, um, to create an account. And, and once they've done that, they've got access to all of the programs with the same functionality as our as our clients have so they that's that's the um the core and then we also have some resources that we have been developing and we continue to develop to help um have health practitioners with various backgrounds you know use those programs to their benefit you know so we've got some well for example we started with a, a guide to video video consultation which was I believe that was prompted by what was going on with COVID and the rapid yes. shift to, to digital and online um, ways of providing support. And more recently, we have a series of resources which break down each of our programs um, for health professionals. So what are the what are we focusing on in those programs? What are the core skills? What are the core, um, you know, sort of worksheets and interventions and all of that? And what are some particular ways that you might support clients who are, enroll in a particular program um, or you know even if it wasn't that particular program who might be who you might be working with um, you know for example who are experiencing anxiety how can a health practitioner pop into one of our anxiety programs and, and take resources or information that's useful for them so that's the the aim of those worksheets all right and what kind of can you give me an example there just uh, just a you know a quick one of, of, of how a health how a health practitioner might might utilize those programs there's quite a few ways um, we hope that health practitioners would utilise our programs. So the um, the sort of the most intense scenario, I suppose, would be that they would enrol in the program themselves, and they would um, their client would enrol in in the same program, and they'd be working through together. So that would really mirror our ther therapist assisted offering, basically. Um, that's that's not the way we think most people are using um, are using the, the the portal, but that's that that's sort of the the one end is you're both going through the program together and you're offering support as your client moves through the program. Much more commonly, I believe our health um, practitioners are using the resources as CPD. I think mm -hmm. that's that's pretty common for them to go in and it might be that they, you know, whether they have a mental health background or not, they could be learning about a particular presentation or about CBT tailored to that particular presentation. Mm. But a lot of our um, health practitioners are, are using that. And a lot of them are, are, are people who are training to be clinicians um, who are using the programs in, in that way to just go and learn. What does this look like? What does CBT for, mm. you know, um, for depression look like? So I, I, that's pretty common. The other way is that you can, whichever way you're supporting, clients, you know, for example, if you're a GP or you're a physio, um, and you're working with a client, you can obviously refer them to the program. You might pop in and have a look and, and see what it's all about. In that case, I would say those resources, the, the tip sheets we've come up with would be really helpful to say, what am I referring to? Mm -hmm. What you know, what would be useful um, for the client? And then the, the final ways is for things like expanding the therapy or expanding the therapeutic hour. So if you were a therapist that's doing a particular kind of work with someone, it might be that you're not doing CBT with them, but you think that some of the CBT skills and strategies would be helpful mm -hmm. as homework or to expand on things. Or it could be that you are, but those worksheets are just really well aligned with what you're doing and, and you're wanting them to, to do some of that as homework and, and come back together. Um, so, And I think that those, those ways of working are, are likely to be much more common than working through the whole program with your clients um, sort of in a one-to-one in -a -one way. Yeah. And I think as as we move into the the future and we're looking at more of these blended care hybrid models of care, I think we're going to see a lot more of that because it really helps um, supercharge your, your therapy when you're you're utilizing that hour with them to to use your skills in the best way possible and work through sensitive issues or rapport or engagement stuff. And then they can go away and build the skills, go through the worksheets, go through the lessons in their own time. And you're not spending your whole hour um, doing that. Um, so I think using it in that way is really, really beneficial, especially when there's, you know, such a, a workforce shortage and shortage of time and, um, and, and you might not see people as frequently as you'd like to. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Think... And and I mean, I guess one of the characteristics of the courses is that that we've got we've got very comprehensive courses, so they cover all elements of, of the cognitive behavioural therapy uh, approach. So it'd have sort of behavioural elements, it'd have cognitive elements, it would have um, exposure. So so laying out all of these things, and relaxation exercises, and so on. So there's a very comprehensive resource that the the there's twelve modules um for each program so they're on the on so some of the longer programs that are available online so that is a great resource that's available to complement what a therapist might be doing in person or, or over video mm. and where can uh, therapists um, and, and clinicians find those tip sheets and fact sheets on how to use those programs um, in their practice where would they look for them so there's a there's a just visit the website so mentalhealthonline.org.au and they um on the menu on the top there's a tab which um for health health practitioners can click on so that's got those resources and and uh, also details on how to sign up for an account excellent so we'll put those in the show notes as well um but um sounds like it's really easy to find on the website which is great and yeah, I mean, I can personally test it. I really found um, um, I utilize mental health online a lot for that kind of free CPD um, use, um, especially through through COVID when there was just a you know huge uh, workloads, huge pressure, and and just didn't have time to session plan as um, as comprehensively as I, I normally would. And I went, oh, I need you know, I need a, a quick session plan or something, and you know. I'll just go on to mental health online and pull off a worksheet or um, a couple of activities. It's all there. It's all sitting there um, rather than having to, you know, shuffle through my, you know, big fat folders from, <laughs> from my <laughs> clinical training days full of what, you know, paper worksheets. It's all there online. It's much easier to, to access. So, yeah, I, I think uh, I really like that, that there's uh, quite a few different ways that practitioners can use these things. It's not like, oh, you know, unless you'll be going to be going through the whole program with clients, there's no point in using it. There's, it's, there's really lots of creative ways that it can help um, augment and enhance the work that we do. Yeah, I hope so. That would be, you know, if whichever way it fits into the work that health practitioners are doing, you know, job well done for us. We're, we're delighted if they're using them in, in any way because it's, you know, if it can save you time, if it can save you effort, if you're able to see, you know, more people, you know, those sorts of things, that's wonderful. It doesn't have to be the whole the whole program. The other thing I'll just mention is that we um, are really accessible in terms of you, if you have any tech issues or questions or anything, we've got a public-facing website. You're very well health practice. Practitioners like clients are very welcome to email contact mho at swin.edu.au and we will actually reply. It'll get to me. It'll get to our wonderful staff, and we'll get we'll get back. So if there are any right. um, issues or anything, it's not a maze. Just email us, and um, we'll you know, we'll sort out whatever the, the question is. Excellent. So yeah, pr practitioners are definitely not on their own. They've got the the support there if they need it uh, for you know utilizing this you know kind of new area for a lot of us um, um, into their work. Oh well, thank you both so much. Um, that's our time for for today. Um, I, I really appreciate you guys coming on and, and being at, being able to have this chat. And I, I really think there's um there's a lot of uh, well, will be a lot of practitioners out there listening who are going to be eager now um, to find ways to integrate uh, this into their work. Um, so I really think they'll be excited to try some of these offerings from Mental Health Online. Um, it's a really good place to start. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, it's been great to be able to talk to you, Tanya, and I uh, hope, hope this is helpful for people. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Mm -hmm.